And welcome to our Sunday afternoon service. So glad you could join in with us. Uh, we're going to do something a little different this month of March. I've already mentioned it. We're going to have missionaries giving presentations, uh, challenges, testimonies. And we'll look forward tonight to hearing from the Coates family. Uh, Brother uh, Josiah Coates and his family are originally from B.C., all the way on the West Coast, I mean West Coast, and they're heading to Quebec, a uh, very needy area of our country uh, that uh, the French influence and things, they need to know about Jesus Christ. And he's going to talk about all about that kind of stuff in his presentation. I know you'll be encouraged by it. Please do pray for his family. They're raising support right now to get there. And uh, pray for this family as they get there and that they'll have a great impact for Jesus Christ. I think you'll be encouraged and strengthened by this presentation and challenge. Thank you for being with us. Well, hello, Legacy Baptist Church. Just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you. And thank you, Pastor Alcock, for allowing us this opportunity to be with you virtually today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Josiah Coates, missionary to Quebec, Canada. I've been there before. It was years ago. I don't know if I would have met any of you, but if I did, uh, hello, if you remember me, if I remember you. If not, well, hello again. But uh, Brother Thiessen is actually my uncle. So I've uh, definitely been to the church, been there a few times, and so Reed's my cousin, so I think he's the one that does the video. So if he did anything weird, it's his fault, and I can blame him. But uh, no, we are thankful for this opportunity to be here with you. We're sorry we can't be there in person. We would love to be, but the uh, situation is a bit difficult at this point, as you know. So we're, we're thankful that we can be with you this way. Pray that our uh, ministry presentation and the message will be a blessing to you. We do hope in the fall to be in Ontario. Hopefully things will be cleared up by then. We can be with you in person. But until then, thank you again. And uh, it's wonderful to, to be with you in this way. God bless you. What do you picture when you think of Quebec? Poutine? The French language? Maple syrup? Extreme winters? European architecture? Or do you think of the most Catholic region in North America? Do you think of the province with the fewest Baptist churches? Do you think of the most secular and atheistic province in Canada? Do you think of a people group that is among the least likely to say they believe in God? We are the Coates family, Josiah, Elizabeth, and Lydia, and God has called us to be missionaries to Quebec, Canada, the most unreached people group in North America. Quebec is the largest and second most populated province in Canada, with a population of almost 8.5 million. French is the common language of 84% of the population with English being a recognized minority. Quebec City is the oldest city in Quebec, founded in 1608 by Samuel de Champlain as the second permanent French settlement in Canada. 80% of Quebecois claim to be Catholic, though only around 10% are actually practicing Catholics. The second largest religious affiliation is atheism, or non-religious. This is largely due to Quebec's history, in the mid-1500s, settlers came from France to establish a new France in North America in order to escape the civil war in Europe, the result of religious strife between Catholics and Protestants. However, this strife followed the settlers to New France, and beginning in 1627, only Catholics were allowed to settle, making what would become Quebec almost exclusively Catholic. Even when the British came in 1763, they remained tolerant of the Catholic Church, which gained even more legal control in 1774. Thus, the Catholic Church has maintained a dominant position throughout Quebec's history, having much influence in government, education, and everyday life. But during the Quiet Revolution which took place in Quebec in the 1960s, everything changed. A growth in Quebec nationalism resulted in violent demonstrations of those seeking to affirm their identity as French Canadians. Amidst these demonstrations, the Quebec government sought to defend French language and culture, and as separatism began to grow, French became an official language in Canadian politics. 
However, this revolution was also a time of religious change. Values and ideas from the past which were tied to the Catholic Church were questioned. Language became more important than faith in Quebec's distinctiveness, and many young people began to reject Catholic teachings. Catholic churches almost emptied as society became very secular. Today, Quebec is a sad example of the effects of sin and is in serious need of a spiritual awakening. Quebec has among the highest rates of common-law relationships, children born out of wedlock rising from 3.7% to 62.9% in just over 50 years, abortion and suicide in the developed world. A recent poll found that only 28% of Quebecers say they believe in God. One Quebec political leader said, I hope God exists, but I have no confirmation. With only 28 independent Baptist churches in Quebec, at least three of these currently without pastors, the Quebecois have a tremendous need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our desire is to help meet this great need. I was privileged to grow up in a Christian home and accepted Christ at the early age of five. Even at a young age, I remember always thinking I wanted to be a missionary. During a missions conference at our church, God used Isaiah's words in Isaiah 6-8, Here am I, send me, to confirm this calling. Through the years, I felt an increased burden for my home country of Canada. I saw many going, but few staying. After graduating high school, I had the opportunity to go on a missions trip to Quebec in 2014. And while at the time I had no desire to serve in Quebec, God used this trip to place a burden on my heart. In 2015, when I returned for a second trip, I surrendered to the Lord's calling to be a missionary to Quebec. That fall, I began my training at West Coast Baptist College and graduated in 2019 with a degree in missions. It was also at West Coast that I met my wife. I grew up as a ministry kid. My dad was an assistant pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina for about seven years and then pastored a small church in Mount Joy, Pennsylvania for about eight years. Growing up, I was always involved in bus ministry. One day when I was six years old, I went out on bus visitation with a lady from our church. She had me read the gospel to the person we were visiting, and she got saved. It was then that I realized that I had never accepted Christ for myself. About a week later, I knelt down beside my bed and asked Jesus into my heart. I had always wanted to be in ministry somewhere, but I never knew exactly how God was going to use me. Josiah and I met in my senior year at West Coast Baptist College. As God brought us together and prepared us for marriage, I knew my calling was to follow Him wherever God would lead. We were married in August of 2018. We are sent by Victory Baptist Church of Langley, British Columbia, and through the help of Baptist missions to forgotten peoples. We will be serving on the field in St. Augustine, Quebec, with Pastor Guillaume Wa and Église Baptiste de St. Augustin. After adequately learning the language and receiving the necessary ministry training, our desire is to fill the need at a church that is currently without a pastor, and one day to reach out and plant more independent Baptist churches in Quebec. There is such a great need in Quebec, and we are praying by God's grace that He would use us to make a difference for the cause of Christ. Would you please help us to get to where God has called us? Would you consider supporting us as we endeavor to reach French Canada with the gospel? But above all else, would you pray for us? Would you pray for the lost souls in Quebec and that God would bring revival to our great country? My prayer is, as Paul said in Philippians 4.17, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account through your giving and your prayer. May the fruit of many French Canadians abound to your account. Well, if you would, take your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus, Exodus and chapter number 5. It will be in Exodus chapter 5. Well, it kind of goes without saying in these days, life doesn't always go the way you want it to. I could probably stick any illustration in there, but it would pale in comparison to life that we're all experiencing right now. Life does not go our way. If life went our way, we would be there with you right now. You wouldn't be watching a video. We'd be in person. We'd get to meet all of you. 
But life doesn't go the way we want it to. You know, aside from COVID-19, 2020, 2021, fill in the blank, whatever you want to put as an illustration nowadays, despite all that, life all the time doesn't go our way. You know, we don't always have as much money as we want to have. That, you know, I'm sure is true of all of us in, in the various times. Maybe you're not content with the job you have. You don't, things aren't going the way you want with the job. Maybe you don't have the house you want. You'd like to have a different house. Maybe God doesn't provide for your needs maybe the way you want. Maybe he doesn't answer your prayers the way you want. You know, we all want to be successful in life. And in ministry, whether you're in full-time ministry or whether you're just a faithful lay person in your church, we want to be successful. We want visitors to be in church. We want people to be added to the church. We want to see people baptized. We want the missions budget to go up to support more missionaries. We want success in our eyes. But it doesn't always go the way we want. I read a quote once that said, If your prayers are answered how you want, who will get the glory? Will God get the glory or will we? If, if God answers our prayers always how we want. We want to be successful, but we forget that when we get to heaven, God will never say to us, well done, thou good and successful servant, but well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Exodus chapter 5 here, we, we come to a time in the story of Moses when life did not go his way. We'll look at just two verses today, verses 22 and 23, if you'd read with me. In Exodus chapter 5, and verse 22, it says, And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we do thank you so much for this opportunity. Lord, for this meeting we can have, though virtual, Though not our way, Lord, help us to see the purpose that you have in it, to not miss what you want to do. And Lord, may we we see you do great things for your glory. May we learn from this story from Moses today. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this point in Moses' life, he had already been commissioned by God at the burning bush to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. And Pharaoh said, yes, right? He let them go. No, no, we know he didn't. Right there, it didn't go his way. But Pharaoh did more than that. He went to the Israelites and he gave them more work and he gave them more burdensome labor and he made it harder for them. And the Israelites came to Moses and they complained to him. So we see here as a summary coming to verse 22, Moses went to God and he said, God, why have you done this? Why didn't you do what you said? Since I came to Pharaoh, he's done evil. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. And in a paraphrase, he said to God, God, I fulfilled my end of the bargain. You didn't fulfill yours. You didn't do what you said. Life did not go Moses' way. You know, it's interesting. If we go to verse number one of chapter six, we see an interesting context. Chapter 6, verse 1, Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. God wanted Moses to see what he was going to do, not what he wanted Moses to do. It says, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 31 says, That according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That's the end of the passage that talks about God using base things and foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God wants to get the glory. God wants to do the work, even when it doesn't go our way. You know, we can never look to tomorrow and see how things will turn out. In 2020, we couldn't look to January 1st, 2021 and say, we know how it's going to work. No, it was a mystery. But now here we are in 2021 and we can look back and see how God brought us through. We can look back and see how God provided, how God was so good, even when the world was going crazy around us. God brought us through. We must have faith and not fear. Buddy was on his first camp out, and as soon as he had pitched his tent, he went for a hike in the woods. About 15 minutes later, he rushed back into the camp, bleeding and disheveled. What happened, asked a fellow camper. I was chased by a black snake. Well, the other camper laughed and said, a black snake isn't deadly. To which Buddy responded, if he can make you jump off a 50-foot cliff, he is. You know, we can look at everything in life and I know I've, I've been there. Look at it with fear. We look at it with uncertainty. We look at it and we lose our focus. Maybe 
In comparison, we jump off a 50-foot cliff from a black snake. We, we overreact. We lose our focus. Have we become spiritually disoriented in these times? Do you need to readjust your spiritual focus? We're going to look today at three ways to refocus your faith when life doesn't go your way. First, and we learn here from Moses, you must refocus on God's presence. Refocus on God's presence. Turn, if you will, to Exodus chapter number 3. We're going to look in brief at what led Moses to this point in his life. We're going to see what God did for him and what God told him and how he needed to refocus first on his presence. Look at Exodus 3 and verse number 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he gave him the commission here, but we'll skip down for sake of time to verse 12. The Lord speaking. And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. Look what he said at the beginning of verse 12. Certainly, I will be with thee. The Lord promised to Moses, the direct promise speaking to him, Moses, I will be with you. Moses, don't be afraid. Don't lose your focus. Now, Moses didn't have this verse, but we have it today, Hebrews 13, 5, where the Lord hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have that promise. We can remember, we can refocus on God's presence when life doesn't go our way, when things go crazy in our eyes, we can remember God is always with us. In Psalm 139, what amazing words we read. And it says, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Psalm 16, verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We can remember the presence of God, that he is always with us. And Isaiah 41, 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. You think in the New Testament when Jesus was about to go to be with his Father in heaven, he said to his disciples, I will send you the Comforter. That's not a description of God. That's a name of God, the Holy Spirit, our Comforter. And His presence, even in these strange times, can be a comfort to us. And when we come to maybe the end of ourselves, maybe we come when we, we don't know what to do, maybe there's, we, we need to stay true to ourselves and the restrictions and the lockdowns and whatever we're facing. We don't know what to do and we lose our focus and we just need to come back and say, Lord, despite all this, you're with me. Despite what happens, Lord, I must remember your presence, your comfort. We know how it ends. We know how God will one day get the victory and justice will come and we'll be with him in heaven. But while we go through these times, while life doesn't go our way, remember his presence. Remember he's with you. Tying into that, the second way we must refocus our faith is to refocus on God's promises. Still in Exodus 3, look at verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land, unto a good land, a large, flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come unto me, and I have seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God gave a promise. He told Moses that he would bring the children of Israel out, that he would do the work, and he had made a promise. Numbers 23, 19, the Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? 
In 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yea and in him amen unto the glory of God by us. God has made so many promises in his word. He has promised to never leave thee nor forsake thee. He has promised to supply all your need. He has promised to be with you. He has promised to comfort you. He has promised to bring you to be with him one day. And when life goes crazy, we must remember and refocus on his promises. And even though we face trials, Paul said we are not forsaken. Remember his promises. In Romans 15.4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And in the promises of God, and both those directed to us and even those that were directed to the Israelites, and God gave a story. He threw those stories, and even the one we're, we're learning from today, we can remember his promises. We can be comforted and encouraged. But I want to focus today on, on this third and final point, to refocus on God's purpose. You see, even in these lockdowns and even in these restrictive times, God has a purpose. He had a purpose for Israel, and so for his church today, he has a purpose. Look in chapter 3 now in verse 15. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt, unto the land of the Canaanites, and will... We see he brings them into those people for sake of time. Verse 18. And they shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And he shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. It's funny, he said right there, he wouldn't let you go. Yet Moses still came and said, God, you didn't do what you said. He said he wouldn't let him go. Interesting, he forgot that. Verse 20, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. God had a greater purpose. You know, his purpose was not just to bring Israel out of Egypt, but to bring them into the promised land. And as a summary, the purpose was one day to bring the Messiah through that chosen people, to be the redeemer of all who will believe in him. That was God's purpose. His purpose was far greater than what they faced in the moment. And so for us today, our purpose is far greater. The purpose God has for us is far greater than what we face. God has a purpose for his people. We see in Philippians 1 verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The work of salvation, we are justified. The work that he has begun in us, he will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. One day we will be with him in glory. One day we will be glorified. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, it says in Romans chapter 8. The destination that God has chosen for his children. The purpose that God has for his people to bring us to be with him in heaven one day. We must not forget that purpose. We must not forget what God has planned for his chosen. Philippians 3, 20 to 21. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You know, it can sound blasphemous if you don't say it in the right way, but one day we will be like God. We will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. It says we are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. One day we'll be made perfect in heaven. We'll be brought to be with him and all our cares. And the Bible says our tears will be wiped away. That's the purpose God has we must not forget that purpose, even when life doesn't go our way. It'll all be okay one day. The doctor said to his patient, I have bad news and worse news. And the patient asked, well, let's have it. So the doctor said, bad news is you only have 24 hours to live. The patient said, I can't imagine what could be worse than that. To which the doctor responded, I forgot to tell you yesterday. You know, whatever we face in life, it could be worse. We're saved. We're going to heaven. 
No matter how this ends in life, no matter how life goes, we're going to heaven. The purpose that God has. You know, that's great. That, that's a blessing. Amen. Close our Bibles, word of prayer, and go home, and that would be great. But the purpose is far greater than that. The purpose is not just for us. The purpose is for everyone. You see, that purpose includes the Great Commission. In Exodus chapter 7, verse number 5. We know the plagues that God was going to bring to the Egyptians and he was going to judge them and bring Israel out with a mighty hand, he said. But verse 5 of Exodus chapter 7, God says, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. See, one of the purposes God has was to tell Egypt that he was God. Was to make an impression on them that there is a God in heaven And you know, that is our purpose today as Christians, not just to go through this life and be encouraged that we'll go to heaven one day, but God's purpose for us is to reach this lost world and to include them in that purpose. A purpose for us today is even through trials and even through hard times and even through restrictions and oppression and sometimes perhaps persecution is to go and tell the world that there is a God, that there is a Savior, that there is a Redeemer, and they can know for sure that when they die, they will go to heaven. That purpose for glory for us is to include others with that to tell others the great commission whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall they preach except they be sent there's a purpose and even when church tries to get canceled the government tries to cancel church and even when we have to live stream and even when we have to virtual and even when maybe we can't talk to people like we could before there's still a purpose and we still must go and include others in the purpose of redemption that God has. Acts 1:8 You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Let the world know about Jesus Christ, about the hope that we have, about the comfort that we have. And the world is longing for hope. And the world is longing for comfort and for peace. And the devil wants to bring his peace. We will know one day the tribulation will come and the Antichrist will come and bring a false peace. But there is a true peace that we can bring to others. And that's the purpose that we must remember when life doesn't go our way. Missions. It's important. There's a need for missionaries. The Bible says the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest. He would send laborers. The purpose. Have we forgotten that purpose even when things have gone crazy, even when life doesn't go our way? Oh, church, we must remember that purpose. We'll be in heaven one day. Praise the Lord. We have that hope. We don't have to fear. We don't have to worry. But if we don't go and Include others on that purpose and see more lost souls come to Christ and get in on that promise. And we've missed the whole purpose of what God really wants to do. I don't know everything God has planned. You know, sometimes we think, oh, maybe God's doing this, and then it takes a turn, and okay, that didn't happen. But overriding all of it is God's purpose to, is that He's not willing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. God's purpose to reach lost souls, even in these times. Oh, have we forgotten that purpose? Have we forgotten what he wants to do through us, even in hard times? We must refocus on his presence. He's ever with us. His promises. More than 365 promises, I believe, one for every day. What promise have you claimed today, this month, this year? Claim it. Be encouraged by it. Remember God's purpose. We'll be in heaven one day. But in that purpose, don't neglect the greater purpose of reaching others in these times. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for today, for this opportunity, Lord, though virtually, to be in a meeting, Lord, in a church service. Lord, I pray that your word has been an encouragement, a blessing. Lord, it's your word. There's nothing I'm saying, Lord, that's not just your message spoken, Lord. I pray that, Lord, we would remember your purpose, even in these times, to to reach others. Though difficult, though challenging, though many will resist, Lord, it's our purpose. 
Thank you that you empower us through your Holy Spirit, through your presence and your promise, Lord, that we can accomplish this by your grace, for your glory. We thank you, Lord Jesus. And we pray this all in your name. Amen. Thank you again, church, for allowing us to be with you. May God bless you.